All right, thank you very much uh, for those of you remaining here for the last session here. Um, I appreciate Karthik, you coming over. No, thanks for um, having me. I guess, uh, uh, just a quick introduction to myself. I'm a professor at Northeastern, uh, as well as an entrepreneur in the FinTech space. Um, it's a real pleasure to talk to Karthik Reddy. And uh, instead of me talking about you, uh, I'll say, there are banners outside that say 125 years of Northeastern. I want to say this is the first panel probably with two Karthiks in the same session, so that's a good, <laughs> yeah, that's a milestone. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want you to start, please, uh, yes. with your origin story yeah. uh, and how you got into this whole VC racket and uh, <laughs> why and, and, and what about it really juices you up. Yeah. No, no, so it's, it's interesting you characterize it as a racket, but... Uh, um, <laughs> No, I think I'm I'm in it for the nobility of it. <laughs> so uh, I say I, I came to the U.S. in '99 for the first time uh, for postgrad at UPenn. So I did my business uh, at UPenn. But when I wrote my SOP, I I, want, I stated as that I wanted to go to Wall Street. And so when I came in, um, it was the peak of the dot com boom uh, for the kids here who were too young to know of such a thing. Uh, it was basically 1999 when um, it was crazy enough that 10% of the previous class didn't come back to school after summer. So they all stayed back in the valley. So that was the peak of the boom. So when you guys get excited about starting up, that was, that was peak madness, actually. It was the equivalent of the tulip fever. So I think um, it inspired me to go and investigate in some sense. And uh, I ended up spending every break I got for the next 12 months in the Bay Area, not in... Wall Street, and uh, was so eager to get there that I actually went there for a banking job because all the jobs dried up. So for those who don't know the history, in April 2000, the Nasdaq crashed, mm -hmm. and most stocks either got wiped out and went into bankruptcy, or even stocks like Cisco, Intel, crashed 90% plus. So basically, there were no jobs for a H-1B seeker like me, and I think I struggled to find my footing for about three, four, five years. But this love for you know, venturing, trying to start up out of my you know, home office, all of this never went away. And I kept trying to break into venture. And then um, the company I worked for got bought by NASDAQ in New York. So finally, Bay Area got booted out of there, uh, needed to save my visa status somehow. So I came back to the East Coast. I spent, till 2006, I was here, now 17 years in M Mumbai. When I went back, I, th I thought I can break into venture in India. It was a baby industry, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first attempt at venture failed miserably in 99, 2001. So most firms that started then, most, uh, both VC and startups, don't exist. The gentleman you saw, Vijay, actually started back then. Right? He started as a value-added services company uh, on top of telco providers. And his journey is actually, as Paytm is probably 13, 14 years, but as 197 communications is probably 25 years now, right? So that was the first wave, but it, there wasn't, I mean, we were on desktop broadband. So there wasn't much of a internet, so to, back, so to speak. And everyone collapsed spectacularly. So in 2006, post uh, seeing the action in China, a lot of the American firms started coming back and saying, India is the next frontier. So Sequoia, Axel, Matrix, um, Norwest, NEA, everybody started making inroads into India. And a bunch of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who had made a lot of money also started. And so basically it was an oligopoly of about 12, 15 firms. None of them were interested in my candidature. So I went, uh, I went to a small tech bank and then uh, got hired by my clients. I went into the media business uh, as a strategy guy for about three, four years. Got to understand the lay of the Indian landscape in a very different avatar that I left. I had done, I worked for three years in American Express Bank before coming to the US. And that was my training ground for just understanding what's going on. And uh, my employer, which was the Times of India Group, made the mistake of deputing me as their go-to guy in the angel networks. So I was the corporate angel for the group. And that allowed me to plug in deeply into the ecosystem. Very thin ecosystem. Four angel groups in the country, maybe three, 400 angels. And I knew 70% of them by name by the end of those three years. So that gave me a lot of insight into going back to this first love and this obsession around saying venture capital is a way out of innovating India into the future. Um, and also breaking away from this traditional trap of 
you know, certain communities and certain industrialists having all the capital advantage. So to me, that's why I see it as a noble adventure in India. Yeah. I also see technology as almost uh, de facto the only vector on which India can outperform, uh, you know, conventional government slash industrial infrastructure. And uh, the government has helped, uh, surprisingly, in this, in this mission. And that was the beginning of the journey. So that's, that's how Bloom started in 2010, 11. It's been 13 years now. Um, yeah, and it just feels like we're getting started. Awesome, amazing. Um, so, you know, on our call, we talked about uh, the ecosystem that's now developed around uh, venture, venture, startups. Uh, when I was uh, graduating college in 2000, uh, it was like, what the hell is this? You know, what is VC? Uh, so, you know, explain or draw, draw the line for kind of how this fundamentally significant transformation took place from zero to kind of bloom now being in, in, a, in a really vibrant ecosystem of startups. Uh, what are the drivers? What are the uh, constraints? Uh, how do you overcome them? I think, um, I think uh, India's strength continues to be um, working uh, despite being resource constrained, right? And so when India brags about having millions of entrepreneurs, it's essentially because we don't have good jobs. <laughs> So you have no option but to be an entrepreneur. We heard from Vijay about that. Yeah, so I mean, we all echo the same sentiment because I think that's what drives us to say that I'm better off trying to do something on my own than actually working for this, uh, this sort of suboptimal job, right? And so even the corner shop guys and entrepreneur, uh, for lack of, in, in their case, lack of education and, and jobs that uh, facilitate them. And I think certain communities, certain educational institutions, that background basically felt like it was actually a trap because you were essentially chasing income and security rather than entrepreneurship. So it was bound to happen. I think it was like a ticking time bomb. It's just that capital was not available. So historically, if you look at the winners from the pre-2010 era, they were built bootstrapped with very little capital because there was no cool thing called venture capital. It's a 16, 15, 17-year-old industry in India. Um, private equity is, thrives but for a different reason because they actually back those bootstrapped entrepreneurs for growth after they've actually built for 10 years. So that, in my humble opinion, doesn't equate with what venture capital does. So I think it was waiting to happen. The angel movement, for example, of both risk-taking as an entrepreneur and risk-taking as a financier, if you see, has probably grown, I would say, 25-fold. Mm. So from three, 400 angels in 2010 when Bloom started, we probably have 10,000 now. It's crazy, right? There are Tier three cities where angel networks have penetrated and people are putting 10, 15, 20 lakhs into some crazy internet idea or electric vehicle idea, which was not there before. I mean, compared to the US, by the way, when I did my research in 2010, there were 300,000 registered angels in the US. Yeah. And I would say India is probably at 10, 15,000 today. It was 400 when we started. Similarly, when, when you look at Bloom, we were the first sort of homegrown, 100% domestically raised fund in venture in India's history. Hmm. Nobody ventured to actually raise money in India. They thought nobody, under, and it's true, like for me to raise 100 crores, which is back then was 20 million, today is only 12, 13 million because of the currency depreciation. 20 million, 600 pitches, 75 conversions to get 100 crores, right? right? So it's just a, it had to be a labor of love to start a venture fund unless you were backed by the Silicon Valley model. And so, the, uh, the, the minute somebody sees someone successful, though that's India or China for you, in a resource-constrained economy, they say, if this guy Karthik could do it, even I can do it. Right? And so suddenly, like, dozens of people rush in, and that's, that's the sense of, that's the nature of competition, that's economic liberalism. So basically, everybody said, if this guy can do it, I can do it too. Right. And so suddenly, there were half a dozen funds, right? All between $5 million and $25 million. That was it. That's all that started that wave. So 2011 to 2015, there were about eight, 10 of us, in addition to the oligopoly of American slash, American branded slash American uh, engineered entrepreneurs starting funds. Nexus, Helion, Inventus were all West Coast entrepreneurs of Indian origin who started funds. That's it, right? And then um, something happened in between 13 and 17. I think this is the transformation that India saw, and which is why all of you who are 
wanting to participate in it in any capacity, I think it's still not too late. It's the time to jump in, right? Because what Vijay has done, 25 years. What I've done, 13 years. These are all still foundational elements. I don't think India has seen its promise yet. Uh, so what happened was two, three things. For the first time, you started seeing one set of companies like InfoEdge, et cetera, making profits. Another set which got fully acquired, like Redbus got sold for all cash. Right. Uh, Just Dial got public. So you started seeing glimmers of this hope. And then Tiger Global had more confidence on in India than Indians had in the way that it backed Flipkart, it backed Ola, uh, and said, the Indian guy can beat the American guy. So we'll allow them to, we'll capitalize them to compete against Amazon and Uber. So this, is a, this crisis of confidence existed in India for like a decade. How can we match up to that big boy there, right? right. And this is, I'm not talking about yet regulated industries. These were not thought of regulated at that point. They got regulated systematically, right? Uh, so, but at that juncture, regulation was not an excuse. Right. Basically, it was just a fear of the big guy has a lot of money, so he can yeah. crush us. And we actually, to Lee's credit, who sits in New York even now, uh, he's out of Tiger, he runs something, uh, uh, he, called, he runs a firm called Addition Capital. I've actually, in my first, se second or third year in my quarterly report, dedicated the entire commentary to Lee actually advancing the Indian ecosystem more than anyone else, right? The single man sitting in New York had more confidence on the Indian ecosystem than any Series B, C player or right. D player in India, right? Or, because right. private equity didn't participate in the venture landscape at all. So I think this was a transformational point. Then the government comes in, uh, Modi had a lot of friendship with the Japanese in Gujarat, right. as he was a CM for 12, 13 years there. And so suddenly the Japanese suddenly start coming in, led by Masa. Right. And suddenly, I remember the statement that Lee made to me, and he said, Masa in one month, between Snapdeal and Ola, put in more money in a month, a billion dollars, into India Venture than Lee had put in six years. <laughs> Right? And so Lee told me, what just happened here? Like, so this guy's put more money than I've put in six years. And I thought I was the most active investor. <laughs> right? And so when you see that, it gave, actually there was a mini bubble. <clears throat> it was threatening to burst in 15, 16. And, but the world venture curve was so steep and that bull run continued till 21, 22, that it didn't break. And so it came back in a, in a hurry. And what, what made it come back is, Geo, UPI, UID, all getting activated in a 12 to 18 month period. Right. So suddenly every citizen of the country became digital in many ways. Right. Identity, trust, commerce, capital, like flows, payment yeah. flows, and the cheapest internet in the world. Right? So in India you can get 35 gigs of data a, a month, one and a half gigs a day, so more like 45 gigs of data, for $3. So when I moved back to India, 2006, the ARPU of an Indian mobile user for voice was 150 rupees, $3. At that time's exchange rate, 2006-07, right? Most telecom m and happened on the basis of ARPU multiplied by number of users. 2016, just after Jio is launched, by 2017, they normalized pricing to a point where the ARPU of a data user in India, which went from 100 million high-speed broadband mobile users to 550 million, $3. Virtually unlimited data, wow. right? The only guys who blow through that data is people who are watching six hours of YouTube for free every day. Right? It's not, a, not people like us. You can't consume the data unless you're not working, right? Or unless you're leaving the video on and roaming around. Or you're watching the World Cup. Yeah. Either even way. then, even then it's tough. Even then it's tough. Unless you're watching a match every day. Right? <laughs> uh, by the way, I heard this fascinating thing of uh, insight recently. There are people who don't buy the monthly pack in India. You know why? Because they're avid gamers mm -hmm. and they want to do real-time gameplay. So they, on the weekends, will buy a 11 rupee pack to get unlimited single-day data so that they don't bust their one and a half gigs data pack, a data limit on a daily basis. That's how calculated India is, right? That's how value conscious India is. Yeah. So you have to build for that India if you want to grab the whole opportunity. 
And that's what all of these folks have done, I think, the successful right. ones. So uh, we touched upon a lot of points we talked about. Uh, I, I'm cognizant that there are a lot of students here. So maybe we can touch on some of the things we talked about, um, uh, particularly with respect to, hey, what is driving a choice uh, by a VC in an investment? What uh, thoughts about exit are part of that mix? Uh, what thoughts about margins, uh, scale, are part of that equation when you're looking at one of these guys comes to you in, in a startup pitch. Uh, what are you thinking? Yeah. No, I think, uh, I think the equations have changed. So when you asked me pre-2015, fund one, um, if you said, what's a grand exit? I would say $100 million. Right. If you went and asked Axel or Sequoia, they would actually say maybe 200, 250. Today, nobody even opens the checkbook unless you say it's a billion dollars of end state value creation. So. A, because the fund sizes have grown. So VCs are the problem here. We are greedy, we raise too much money. And therefore, when we raise too much money to deploy that money and get the outcome that me meaningfully moves the needle, you need a very large outcome. So market size, therefore, and how you can monetize that large market size becomes super important. Right. So you can't come and tell me I'm building this. In, in the US, by the way, you can build a very niche business which gets to $100 million of revenue. Yeah. In India, you go to grab the entire country to get hundred million dollars, right? And that's the difference. The, what, what can get you three dollars, four dollars here as a tip is this average order value of a food order delivery there, right? So please understand that the math's got to make sense at scale value conscious. So we are, as a VC, I think our core forte is do we have a view on where the markets are going to go? And do I believe someone can build a hundred plus million dollar revenue business and with a decent enough margin structure that you can make 10, $20 million of EBITDA, and right. that will be a 750 to a billion dollar business. It's very simple rules of thumb for all the entrepreneurs in the room, right? right? And so if you're building into India, and if you can't showcase how that is possible, what Vijay said is true. Uh, people who pitch us a particular product or an idea, almost nothing about it remains constant two years into the journey. Two years into the journey. Forget about five years, right? Uh, because we do seed investing predominantly. So essentially, what are we betting on? We're betting, therefore, the second element. Are the founders really passionate about what they solve? Right. Because fundamentally, the idea will break, the market will change, competition will change, regulation will change, but you have to overcome all those setbacks and still build a billion dollar business, which is basically a minimum of 15, 20 year journey, which most entrepreneurs don't bargain for. Right. They think they can, and coming to your exits, therefore, they think there's a cool M&A down the line, and right. it's non-trivial in my mind. There is a, Indian markets are not set up for M&A, because M&As are a function of an evolved market like the US, where there is a boatload of cash waiting to buy innovation, which is sitting outside of the company, right? In India, it's been done by convenience of cap tables, where one set of VCs got tired funding the company, so they package it off to the other, because there's no more money to fund the losses. If you're profitable, you might as well go public, right. right? And so we've become at least very strong proponents publicly, as I've shared with you, that the better idea is to go public, even if you're subscale, because by US standards, you're a penny stock if you're 250 million. In India, you're a credible stock. At 1,500, 2,000 crores, it's, you're a decent small cap who mutual funds will buy, by the way, right? And if you get to 5,000 crores, you're a mid cap. There are only 350 companies in India above 5,000 crores of market cap. Right. That's it, right? So what is there to be ashamed of? You're in the top 500. You're like the equivalent of the S&P 500 in India, right? So just grow, the, grow into that in the public domain rather than cheating your way into private valuations, which don't make any sense. And nobody, you can't exit, by the way. It's a myth that you can exit easily by selling that to someone. So might as well get profitable and grow on the public markets. Mm -hmm. So I think venture has to tune itself to these outcomes rather than, and the quick M&As are a mirage. Right? Even when they happen, they really don't show up with big dollars. Right? Uh, you loan 10% of a $50 million exit, you make $5 million. My fund, current fund is $250 million. Who cares about $5 million? Yeah. You're an expert in uh, consumer, and dis distribution in India is, is definitely about digital distribution and how, how that works, right? So talk a little bit about that, because go-to-market is a fundamental issue uh, when you're starting a company or running a company, right? So I think what is, in fact, it is the only advantage that Indians 
tech startups have today over the legacy builders, right? So if you look at fintech today, highly regulated, All right. RBI or SEBI will have a view on everything you build in fintech. If not in year one, year two, by year three, they'll be on your backside, right? So you're, you and the biggest offline guy start becoming on regulatory or you're on the same level playing field. So I was giving this fascinating example where one of our companies, Slice, decided to go to the equivalent of the subprime market and issue credit cards. Now the problem is they were an NBFC and all they had was what's called a prepaid instrument right. license, PPI license. So they tried to go on the back of a bank balance sheet and actually issue these, license, these, right. these cards. RBI came down heavily and banned the idea. Yeah. They said, oh, we didn't set up the PPI license for credit cards. So now you're on a level playing field. So two things, this is how India has to adapt. The founder has to be courageous enough to go and now sit and talk face to face with the regulators. Hmm. Which is the central, it's like going to the Fed here in India, in the US. And basically it's saying, whatever the new equation for the game is, I'm willing to comply, which is what he did. And the regulator encouraged them to say that there are a lot of small banks which are flailing. Why don't you see if you want to buy one of them? And guess what? He's making a bid for it and he got an approval. He's buying one of them, right? And so hopefully when the transaction completes, he'll be able to issue cards as a bank. One of my little tiny startups from six years ago is going to become a bank, right? And so it is a proud moment, but it's also like a staggering moment to say that how does it compete with HDFC or ICICI, which have the coverage they do? It's because you're bringing a brand new experience for a very different set of customers. Right. You're, and by the way, I've used Slice. I've used the card before it got banned. I've used the online-only version of it as a PPI card. I've never had a physical interaction with that company other than the card being shipped to me once. Never. Hmm. Right? So it's, the entire experience is digital. Okay. Right? And so... Digital becomes then, given all of the infrastructure that the government has given you, the cost of distribution in India, which was used to be a challenge. How do you get the SBI to one more branch? How does Citibank ever open another branch? Right? There's no chance that you get to open more branches in India. The infrastructure is very expensive. Now you don't need that infrastructure. Right? And, and, so, and I'm just giving you one example. Yeah. And this will happen as a, education cannot be online only, but for a certain age group it can be. And there's an interesting company called Virohan in our portfolio, which is doing a hybrid model of a, someone who's a facilitator in the classroom, but the teachers are actually highly qualified doctors, right, who are teaching radiology and all of these courses. And it's working like a charm, right? And so you have to think about how to digitize more and more pieces of your distribution, both in terms of delivery, it could be delivery of content, it could be transaction, it could be verification of identity. Dream 11 couldn't have become Dream 11 if not for digital, hmm. right? 200 million users last month, 200 million, right? And so that speed, that scale, no chance if we didn't, we had, we didn't have the digital infrastructure, both right. on payments and identity. If one had happened and not the other, right. they would look like an old telecom right. firm. Well, we, we, we have about maybe two minutes before Ravi will tell me to get into questions. So read the tea leaves a little bit, you know, look ahead and see where you think this market is going, uh, what are going to be the opportunities and challenges, especially from the entrepreneur's perspective. Yeah, I think uh, one thing we didn't touch upon is about 35-40% of our portfolio, every vintage, we're in our fourth fund, every fund has been cross-border. Right. Okay, so if you're sitting in the US and you spot opportunities, maybe not in consumer, a lot mm. of you are young students, you haven't seen the workplace, the marketplace, but in SaaS, in enterprise software, in anything which is truly technology, India has an advantage of having a low-cost ability to innovate compared to the rest of the world. And I think... We are underweight on that. I think we should be pulling our weight far more than Israel and other markets. Um, so India is like, in my opinion, 35, 40% of the venture opportunities like Israel, export innovation, and 60, 70, 60 65% is right. built for disrupting Indian, the way India runs. Right, right. Now within that, I think everything that impacts um, you know, small businesses or consumers in ease of availing a service or a product is still open market. It's just that you have to, one thing you have to be careful about India is that you get very, you don't, the very few businesses are gonna be purely digital 
and the examples, and they therefore can be super profitable. So if you don't touch the physical layers at all, then actually it could be a very interesting business. So the best examples are Dream11 and, and uh, um, our friends at um, Zeroda, right? So there is actually no physical interaction at all. You have an entirely digital broker with a digital experience, and there you have a you know, digital gaming play, which, is, you know, which has no interactions otherwise. With, so it's not easy. And the second part of that is getting these kind of companies, you're getting the consumers to pay you like what they value, right? So if they value, that's what that Economist article I shared with you says, zero the ch refuses to go to zero dollars per customer opening, it charges two and a half dollars. It is 200 rupees. But if people see the value, they will pay the 200 rupees. Right. And so when you have millions of users, it's very, very remunerative. So I think your key is, if you can't deliver at value and you think you can burn VC dollars to get there, it's a very short-term drug which will run out of its utility. And then you will die a spectacular death. <laughs> and so I don't, think, I don't think that's why you should start up. I think you should start up if you believe you want to build something sustainable long-term. Of course, there is a lot of thrill in learning, failing. It's, it's romanticized. It is a, it's a venture romanticized model that fail fast, it's okay to die, all of that is great. But India is a tough market, right? And so you have to, then you be ready for those setbacks, right? It's a, it's a game that not everybody is equipped to play. Most entrepreneurs can't play that fail fast model. Got it. Uh, I think we can start taking some questions at this point from the audience. You can see about three hands, the two here yeah. as well. Hi, uh, so firstly, I'm a huge fan of you and the Bloom podcast. Thank so you, sir. it's a big moment. And also, like, as you said, you are like an expert in consumer and retail. So usually when people look at consumers in India, it's largely divided into like India 1, India 2, and India 3. So it would be great if you could elaborate on that and if you think there is further, uh, like, further segmentation in each of the segments. And where do you see the most opportunity of like, rise in the next decade or five ten years? It's a very curious thing. So everybody who's targeted India One has, has predominantly moved to either commerce and brands uh, or they've moved to finance because the bulk of the, the wealth is sitting with India One, right? The problem is it's super crowded because everyone's chasing those same rich people, rich relative to where India is at, the first 50 million people, the first 100 million people. So India One, you've got to be very sure, is there a differentiator at all? long-term sustainable differentiator, right? In what product you're selling. India 2, India 3 is all value conscious, right? And so if you're going to education or you know, uh, sort of micro-commerce of any kind or digital media, et cetera, then you've got to be able to deliver at a price point that nobody in the world can. So like we have a dialect-based Netflix play in our portfolio, which we think o over a period of time will overtake Netflix, right? But what Netflix charges for a year, these guys, for a month, these guys will charge for a, month, a year. You gotta be able to deliver that content at that cost. And I think you can, right? And that's the way to seg segregate the two. The other way to think about it is need versus desire. India is a need market first in my humble view. 80% of value creation will be built for addressing needs of people where I'm willing to pay because I'm, I have to fulfill this need, right? So versus, Oh, I'd like to have this. Conspicuous consumption is a mi mirage in India, right? And, and, it, it, and it's limited to a very few set of people. And I'm not ashamed to say a lot of my wardrobe comes when I shop out overseas. So how are you going to cater to me if you're selling in India, right? So we're spoiled for choice, right? The elite class, right? So on daily consumption, yes, I need my meals in India, so I'll order for 2,000 rupees on Swiggy. But like for other stuff, you're not going to be able to cater to me. So be very careful about making those choices on what you're chasing in India One. Yeah. Hope Hi. that was useful, yeah. Hi, I'm Pranav. So I think he was quoting from the Indus Valley report. Uh, he so, was quoting, yeah, Sajid's yeah. report, yes. Yeah. So, so I guess in the same report on one of the slides was talking about how Paytm innovated in the payment space by introducing the sound box. Sound box, yeah. So, so how often do you see such innovation companies, sorry, such innovation coming from companies in the portfolio? And also how often do you see such innovations coming uh, as pitch decks? Because it's, I mean, only if they were, uh, payments and UPI did that sound box come in or like there and then for uh, phone pay also you know followed up 
So how often do you see such? Innovations? So it'll get, it'll get copied as you saw, saw right? Everybody has a, has a sound box now, but it was genius from Vijay's stable that, you know, the person on the street doesn't know, you can't keep showing your phone saying, I made the payment, right? So just having a sound alert was just a fascinating way to close that out. And like, even it surprises me when I hear the sound, right? And so it's a nice delight moment. It creates brand affinity. It creates like brand loyalty. So there are interesting hooks in that. And being the first mover will always give you that advantage. Now, I think those kind of things can never come from Amazon potentially, right? Or Google Pay. That's a Google Pay, that innovation, I think they kept in pace with the best in India, right? But this is actually what India needs, right? You have to think through the problem from the grassroots in India, not import innovation from overseas, especially when you're catering to those 500 million people, right? So probably the Google Pay team worked because they were all Indians sitting in Bangalore, and they actually, they actually, and that has been exported to many countries, by the way, right? It's one of those few innovations that took off from India. By the way, all of what you see, a lot of the elements that you see in Uber today are all Indian innovations, by the way. We hated surge pricing, so they took it, took it away. You just get a price now in, in this part of the world. A uh, lot of those innovations are India, actually, which drive it. So I think you, know, you, you have to think about Indian audiences and opportunities as a very, very different set that you're innovating for um, and when, you, when you're catering to that market. And if you can, and if you can build a moat, and that's my, one of my first questions in the first pitch, what makes you think you have an edge for solving for the problem? I'm not obsessed about the idea or the product or what the app will look like. All of that's going to change in 12 months. I know that, right? But fundamentally, if the founder doesn't come with some insights, then you're just winging it, right? And even that, once in a while, you might back an outrageously bold founder. But that's what you want to see at seed, at least. And then we've seen, as I said, Slice basically was very innovative when it started, right? They shut them down, but they're being reborn in some other avatar. Um, what other interesting thing? I mean, Dunzo was a category leader, suffering today for being too early and blowing up too much money, perhaps. Uh, it was our portfolio. We wrote the first check. Yeah, yeah. So early movers have a curse on them. Yeah, that happens often. Hi, Karthik. Um, apart from AI, what do you think India needs its startup development in? AI actually think is overrated. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, especially for a, for a market like India, if it doesn't find its way into the end use case application areas, and that too at the cost structure that we are speaking about, same, the same promise will fall short as we speculated for five years around blockchain, right? So the end state applications are there, but not at the cost structures that the West can afford. You can't have infrastructure which is ex the same price as it is in Boston. Infrastructure. Right? The reason it's taken off is UPI and UID are government subsidized. Right? If somebody was asking you to pay on a private basis, they wouldn't have taken off. Right? Um, so for me, uh, I think the government's doing, somebody asked me, what is, what's up with the government? They do UID, then UPI, now they're doing ONDC, then they're doing bill, Bharat Pay, uh, bill, uh, whatever it's called, Bharat Bill Pay or whatever. I think what the government has a view on whether they should even allow private companies to make super normal profits if they believe the service can be extended to half a billion people. So the minute something starts touching half a billion lives, so we want to say in it, right? So I think you have to anticipate that. If you actually believe you can service half a billion people with your product, you should anticipate the government's coming, right? And they're going to regulate, and they're going to make it easy for you to give easy for consumers to have frictionless, costless ability to, you can't make money off that transaction layer. So today, auto and, and auto rides in Bangalore are more of a ONDC framework than on Uber and Ola. Fascinating, right? So I think, because they don't care about the, the rich guy taking the airport ride yet. Right? <laughs> so they're worrying about the auto person who uses this as a proxy for public transport. So I think that's the lens you have to look at. Um, everything else, I feel, you know, if you're building in diagnostics, you have to have an edge over an offline diagnostics chain, right? So you have to think through what makes you win in each market, because end state economics are the same. Just because you're a cool person who has a cool brand and an app, you're not going to outcompete Krishna diagnostics. Right? <laughs> so, so you have to think about end state economics are the same, right? 
And a lot of people misunderstand India by thinking, just because I'm a digital business, I'll have different end state economics. Right? If you're selling food, it's the same economics. If you're selling a cab ride, it's the same economics. The guys in the original cab ride business are all thriving, by the way. <laughs> They're not dead and gone. They're all profitable. It's our guys who are, the <laughs> digital guys who are losing money. <laughs> Have we finished with zero seconds? So yeah, yeah, well. we'll take one more question. Very inspiring. Thank you. Do you think digital media, education was the equalizer, public education was the equalizer, reducing the gap of haves and have-nots? Do you think in 21st century, digital uh, access to masses will reduce the gap of our it has the ability to, but I don't think it's as trivial as thought out to be in the pandemic. Right? Um, I think primary education, as my colleague Sajid puts it very cleverly, primary education is a combination of building social skills, daycare for the parents, and education. Right? Education is a component of it. So firstly, you can't take children out of schools. So that's, that's what the use case is. Then school is so tenuous that you can't suddenly build a program outside of schools. You've got to make this work in schools. You can't have a parallel system outside of it. And then if you don't get the foundations right till age 15, you've already disadvantaged those kids. Half the kids in India can't compete, right? Just set them up for failure, relatively speaking. And so that has to be fixed. I don't think online can fix that. Online fixes a determined kid at 15 who's got the basic ingredients to outshine anybody in the planet. That's what it is, right? And I think pre-15, we have bigger problems to solve. I don't think digital allows for, you know, facilitator in a, in a small village or something of that nature. But it's tragic that if you go to a lot of these places, there's absolutely no inbuilt sort of, uh, uh, you know, inspiration from either the teacher side or the government side or the facilitator side or the, the student side or the parent side to actually make this scale to the next level. Not enough. Delhi has tried some interesting experiments, but we need, I think that's the, that's the big devil that the government has to fix. If there's one thing that the government should focus on, top to bottom, it should be education till 15. It should be like compulsory consignment, like how the Israelis and the Singaporeans put people in the army, right? You can't not have a kid be educated to almost perfection till 15. It should be a centralized mandate for the entire country. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much and really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks.